Our guests today are Alan Miller and Jennifer Lawrence. My name is Natalie Asper-Carnes, your DEMA Virtual Chapter President, and I'm delighted to be your host today. The fundamental purpose of the Domestic Estate Management Association is to raise industry standards. We are a network of individuals striving to make a difference, interested in better serving and protecting the best interests of our principals and clients. DEMA's Virtual Chapter provides an arena for for all members, regardless of title, time zone, or involvement in a local chapter, to access and participate remotely in a face-to-face -face environment for learning and networking. We encourage very engaging and relevant industry discussions involving presenters from within our private service professional community, global affiliates, preferred suppliers, placement agencies, educators and principals, along with occasional guest speakers. Today, we continue our series titled Professional Ethics and Boundaries, and our first panel discussion where we will dive into the details of a PSP's personal life, after hours, live in, live out, and peers with today's guests, Alan Miller and Jennifer Lawrence. Alan Miller, a certified American butler and executive chef, has been in private service for over 33 years with nearly half this time serving as an estate manager, as an estate manager to his current principal. Alan previously served as Director of Education and Headmaster for the Starkey International Institute for Private Home and Estate Management and continues to mentor former students in the art of service. In addition, Alan provides hospitality consulting services to luxury hotels, restaurants, and private estates. Jennifer Lawrence, President and Founder of Luxury Lifestyle Logistics, is an estate management consultant serving a global base of high net worth clients addressing their private services private service challenges to help their staff manage properties more effectively. With over 18 years of industry experience, Jennifer has been consulting for the last eight years. Jennifer is also chapter president for DEMA's Chicago chapter and has actively served on its board for since 2011. So get your questions ready. Without further ado, Alan, Jennifer, welcome to DEMA's virtual chapter. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, thank you. Alan, are you there? Unmute your microphone, there we go, yay. All right, so let's dive right in. First of all, what are potential pitfalls of being in private service and how can we avoid them? Anybody wanna dive in on that one? So my cheats, Oh, I'm not hearing Alan. Let's let him uh, mute himself and play with his microphone settings. Well, Jennifer, do you want to stay with, take, take that? Uh, I think we started out with, um, how about hot topics? Um, sure. I mean, um, so if any of us um, have been in the hot seat before, I think we all can appreciate the nuances of working for a private family and just um, navigating the ins and outs of that relationship. Um, there is a dichotomy between um, professionalism and being too personal and the ways in which we work in their personal space but maintain that professional um, boundaries and, and line of decorum. So um, it, it's a unique environment as we all know <laughs> in working in someone's home or um, you know closely with an individual if you're a personal assistant in their office environment. Um, you have a working relationship unlike a corporate setting and so um, sometimes you know lines tend to get blurred because you are working in such close quarters with um, your principal, um, your boss rather, um, so we typically refer to them as the principal or the principal homeowner and um, it's challenging because you are involved in the nuances of their everyday life and certainly the details of it, but yet you have to kind of maintain this boundary as though it's all just, um, you know, uh, details and that you're not actually immersed in the personal aspect of it. So um, I think that that's the, the best way to maintain that professional boundary is just to make sure that um, you, you may be aware of what's going on. Um, certainly and it's a necessity of your job title um, to know the ins and outs of things that might be going on on your estate, but to not ever um, make it a, a personal um, you know, thing with the individuals. I kind of akin it to going to the doctor. The doctor maintains his professional boundary, although they, you might be very exposed. Um, you know, maintaining that professionalism um, helps you be more comfortable, helps um, the client or principal or patient be more comfortable. Um, so I think that that's the best way to, to navigate some sticky situations. 
Okay, so what are some hot topics to avoid when, when you're working with your principal? I mean, certainly politics and religion, um, let's just be honest, you know, you, you may have very strong political opinions or religious preferences, but um, you just they can't. They may as well. And they may as well. Um, but that is just something that is not um, a necessity to perform your job function, unless it is. Um, we actually have some friends who attend DEMA uh, convention every year that I know, and they work in um, very religious um, families. And the, the rules and regulations of their religious aspect of the family's life actually um, play into uh, the nuances of how the staff interact in the home. I mean, you know, uh, Jewish family, you know, they close down the house on the Sabbath, um, you know, what can and can't be turned off, you know, the appliances have to be on, on Sabbath mode, all these types of things. And so, um, while that is an aspect of the family's life, we never want to comment on um, the, the particular nature of it. So it's just um, a, a detail that we have to navigate, but we, we definitely don't want to make our opinion known in those regards. Um, I've worked many events for principals for political fundraisers and serving canapes and cocktails to maybe a candidate that I didn't support, but I'm there in a professional aspect. And, you know, certainly they have tried to rope me in and say, oh, take a picture or, you know, do you want to comment on this situation? And no, you just have to kind of maintain the boundaries and, um, and you're there to serve a function and you may not necessarily agree with the political endeavors of the family, but it's important to, um, you know, to just um, be, be a professional in that regard. So certainly politics and religion, I mean, there are a string of, um, you know, topics that we will get into today, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's more challenging than working in an office environment for sure. Absolutely. So Alan, do we hear you now? Nope, not yet. All right, we'll let Alan We'll give Alan another minute there. Um, so how about um, uh, personal opinions? Personal opinions are challenging because you're often asked for personal opinions, um, but it's always in the nature of, uh, within the context of your job. So, um, you know, if you're in an administrative uh, position, you're interfacing with all of these subject matter experts on behalf of the principal. And oftentimes they want your opinion because you're a trusted advisor to them as well. Um, let's say a designer, a decorator, um, you know, even construction management, you know, you have a voice because sometimes we have this sixth sense as to what will go on after, um, go on after we leave um, that environment and we know, you know, potential pitfalls that the family is facing. So I've been roped into conversations with designers and, you know, all different types of vendors and they say, oh, what do you think? And, you know, it's not about um, the personal choices that the family might be making in terms of design or construction or anything like that. It's about um, the functionality. And so I always try to maintain my um, professional opinion from the sense of functionality or operations. And I think, again, that's the way to maintain discretion and decorum. Uh, I'm not going to comment whether or not I like the rug. You know, I don't think that's ultimately what they're asking me. They want to have the designers weigh in their opinion on that. But perhaps I can say in this high traffic area, perhaps this rug is not a good idea. Or maybe would you like to have it in another area? Or I can certainly you know, maintain it for you if we need to turn it every six months you know, to make sure that the wear and tear is even. Um, so th they always want to have your opinion, but it's from your position. It's not just a blanket statement as to, um, your likes or dislikes, um, in commenting on behalf of the family's, you know, personal endeavors. So I think that that's the best way to approach those types of things. Well, and, and always waiting till you're asked for your opinion as well. Exactly. Exactly. If you weigh in your opinion too soon, you know, you've crossed that boundary and, um, they, it may not be warranted. Your opinion's not necessarily needed at all times. Um, and so that's where you can get to enmeshed with your employers. Mm -hmm. um, how about, anybody, Natalie? pardon me. Okay. Is that Alan? Yes, I can. All right. So Alan, how about talking too much about mm -hmm. your personal life? Do, are well, you allowed to have a personal life? 
it is tough to sit here and not be able to say a word because as you know, <laughs> I am a man of a thousand opinions. Yes, uh, you are. And so, yet your principal thinks you have none. Yeah, exactly, yes. Um, speaking of um, um, what she just said, um, we used to say at the school, um, we are in the home, but not of the home. Mm -hmm. And the temptation is very, 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 very strong to sort of want to join in and initiate familiar conversation. And you have to really watch that. Uh, anybody in the personal protection business knows that when it comes time to react, even though you may not have to do it once in a, but maybe once in a lifetime, uh, when it comes time to react, your discipline has to be so, you have to be so well under control that boom, you just do it without thinking about it. And that's the way you have to respond and you have to train yourself to think in terms of, of, of um, responding to, to the principal uh, because you're not there to be the best friend. Uh, you're there to be what they need right now. Um, and so if they, some, a lot of times they just talk because they need a sounding board and you're it. Um, so that you have to remember that this is not your average, even though it feels like, and it seems like on their end, it's a casual conversation. Uh, it may not always be, and you have to always go with that as your person. So we're in the home. We're not of the home. Um, the next thing is, is that one of the, one of the things we used to do is I always made sh sure that we, part of the program was we, we, uh, show the film, the remains of the day with Anthony Hopkins. And there's a, line, that, there's a line in that film where he had served somebody who was part of the Nazi party. And somebody was asking him about moral judgments and how did you feel about that? And, and uh, you know, this, this horrible man and what they did. And he said, my job is not to judge him. My job is to serve him. And you really, really, really have to kind of you know, now, obviously, if you're working for a serial killer, that you might want to draw the line. But, you know, if, if you don't agree with somebody's politics act exactly, and you have to serve drinks to somebody who supported the candidate that you didn't, you don't throw drinks in their faces, or you don't, like, break their windows at 2 a.m., you know, you do what a professional does. Um, I'm going to counter that point, Alan, and... Um say that I had some pretty difficult principles early in my career and we all do what is necessary to move our resume forward um, right. and perhaps we take uh, on a position that we know is going to be incredibly difficult. I've been yelled at within an inch of my face just because they were um, a person that thrived on aggression and you know it was a very difficult uh, working environment but um, I think that once we get past that point when we have some longevity in private service and certainly, you know, have a little bit more choices that we can make in the principles we serve, um, I do think that if you're faced with two job opportunities, um, it's nice to be able to choose the, the principle that you support on a moral and ethical level. Um, I, even though that um, is never spoken between you and you don't have to delve into your personal beliefs, I do think that we are the cogs in the wheel that keep the family turning. And um, if I'm supporting the, the larger work that they're doing in the world, um, it's really nice to know that I'm a small part of something that I believe in. And I, you know, now, you know, almost 20 years of service later, um, I have been blessed to work for some incredible people doing amazing philanthropic things, um, you know, in the U.S. and around the world. Um, and although I cannot make claim to any money that they've donated or anything that they've done, you know, with their, with their charities, um, right. when I'm serving at those types of functions. I feel inspired that I have played a small role in that. So, um, I do think that, you know, on certain occasions we are, um, asked to serve people that we don't necessarily agree with, but, um, you know, grinning and bearing it and just getting through until you can find a principle that you really respect and admire oh, sure. of course. is the ideal, so. Yeah, oh, I, I, would, I would definitely, my, my uh, principles and I agree politically all, almost 100%. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so it's been a wonderful experience, um, but we've also been able to have conversations about things that we disagree with. But then again, that's after almost, well, close to 15 years now. Uh, but but what, what I'm talking about is uh, serving people who happen to be guests, um, you know, who are saying things that are contrary to what you believe. It's like, at, at that point, you're not part of the meeting. You're part of the service. You're part of the thing that makes it all happen. Uh, you're part of the container. You're not part of the, the, the contents. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just think in, in terms of like working in a corporate setting, you want to be in a line with the company's values and mission statement. And so it is yeah. so nice when you can get to that point. 
Um, not to say that we all are at all times of our careers, but um, there is a synergy when you feel like you can get up and go to work every day and, and kind of pour into your own um, you know, self and the, the containers that you're serving um, and feel like there's a real ease uh, of the relationship there. So I wish that for every private service professional. Um, certainly in my consulting practice, I, I deal a lot with um, employers and um, you know, candidates in conflict with one another. Um, so I see the turmoil that happens when communication breaks down and all of these types of things. And it is so enmeshed personally because it is such a close, you know, working environment. But um, if you can, if you can work for someone that you genuinely trust and respect, it's, it's all the better. Oh, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, because what you're doing is you're putting everything, bodily fluids, as I call them, blood, sweat, and tears into <laughs> something. And you want it to count for something that's, that's good in the universe. It's true. Uh, any job. Hopefully, so, anybody would do that. So moving on to more potential pitfalls, uh, Alan mentioned one uh, that really caught my ear. Um, anything you say to anyone outside the house, I'll let you carry that one on. <laughs> oh, well, um, if you, I try to, principals will always say in the interview, well, we need someone who can be really proactive. It's like, well, I don't know how to tell you this, but my job is to react. I react to you and what you need. Uh, I set myself up with vendors and skills and, and filing systems and, and to, to react proactively, but I, I consider myself a reactor. Uh, I don't know when the AC is going to go down. I don't know when the refrigerators are going to stop working. I don't know when one of the housekeepers um, is not going to come in. And so I've trained myself to do all of these things and can you know knock out that shirt in less than seven minutes on the ironing board if I have to, you know, and it'll look just as good as if it came from the cleaners. But the only reason I can do that is because I have no life. But but that have, but all comedy aside, um, so um, when you're dealing with vendors who come into fixing, so I set myself up to react proactively, and I've got a list of HVAC people and smart home people. I don't know why they call it smart home. It never works like it should, but that's another sermon for another time. But um, so they come in and you start having these casual conversations with them and you want to develop a rapport, but at the same time, you don't want to sell out confidentiality. And some people in their desperation to create a rapport will say, oh, well, they're gonna be going to Europe and they need to get this done. And, and so that we've gotta get this done before. And the next thing you know, that person is interfacing with the employer and, oh yeah, well, Miller was just telling me that you're getting ready to go to Europe. And so I wanted to, oh, really? You can't do that. It doesn't make any difference why they want it done. We just need it done. Right. Uh, not that, you know, we don't care that family are coming to visit in two days. We don't care that there, that's none of the vendor's business. So we have to keep it. You have to remember that. Once again, it's like that personal security person who is trained to boom without thinking about it. You have to train yourself to do that without thinking about it. It's not being rude. It's not being lording your position over somebody. It's protecting the interest of the, of the person that is trusting you. I love how you phrased it before. Anything you say to anyone outside the house will be the first thing they tell your principal the next time they meet, and it will be misconstrued to your detriment. Absolutely. In casual conversation. Oh, yeah. Well, Miller was telling me that, you know, it's just making casual conversation because that's what they do with their friends all day long. And the boss will say, huh, what else is he telling you? You know, you just, you just can't do it. Uh, and, and it takes a certain degree of training. Um, I love the quote, the man who would be king must first rule the empire of himself. And if you can't fix this, then you got to stop at that point and get that taken care of and then move on. Discipline is the key to freedom in, in this business. And it's not like any other profession. Um, and, and nobody else who does what you do is, or, or who doesn't do what you do is going to be able to relate to it. Oh, I can't make it this weekend because something's going on at work. And they're going to say, well, you just need to find another job. You just need to tell those people. And it's like, you don't understand. I love every second of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not a burden for me because this is what I love to do. So the fact that I can't make it, you're the one who has a problem with it. I, I'm okay with it. And to explain to them that it doesn't mean they're any less important to me. It's just, this is, this is what I do. And uh, people who do paramedic work and people who do EMT work uh, and people who work in the emergency room and people who work um, for the electric company, you know, wh when the hurricanes come, they have to forget their children's birthdays and go put lines back together. All right. So 
When it comes to graciously answering inappropriate questions, such as, hmm, uh, I see Mrs. So-and-so has XYZ. Suggestions? Uh, m my favorite is always very flippant and makes me sound like a jerk, but it's always, gee, I'd love to tell you, but then I'd have to shoot you. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. And yeah. that, that, you know, that doesn't always fly when it's a guest or, you know, someone who doesn't understand my sense of my dry sense of humor. So, or, you know, or they happen to know that, no, anyway. Um, so the suggestions, how do you, how do you, how do you handle some of yeah, those situations? Um, I, I do this multiple ways, Natalie. I love your recommendation of just using polite humor um, to deflect. Um, you know, I think that that's just a, a, the best approach and people understand um, that you're doing that graciously um, and not trying to dismiss them. Um, you know, and if they press you, you just say, I'm, I'm not at liberty to say, I'm very sorry. You know, I think just being polite but firm is definitely something that is a, a, good, a good tactic. Um, and then I, I, I like to say too, well, you'll have to ask Miss or Mrs. You'll have to ask the principals. You know, it, it just depends on the makeup of the conversation. Um, you know, even um, vendors that are quite trusted um, within the circle, let's say um, a child tutor or, you know, someone who's over at the home constantly. Um, oh, you know, how's Jimmy doing in math class or whatever? You know, I'm, I'm really not at liberty to say thank you for coming over for your appointment. Um, I'll, I'll let Mr. or Mrs., you know, um, discuss that with you directly. And of course, you know how they, he's doing in school, but it's not your place to say. Um, you know, perhaps they're going to be switching that vendor out, um, that tutor out in the near future, and they don't want to perpetuate the relationship anymore. So um, I think you can deflect graciously. I think you can just polite but firm and just tell them no, you know, you never want to use the word no, but just, um, you know, just not give them an answer. Um, using humor, um, and you can play dumb. You can say, I'm sorry, I don't have that information, you know, and you might very well have had the information, but um, it, again, it's not yours to repeat. And this goes for vendors, you know, trusted subject level experts and things. Um, so I kind of, I, I kind of put those on two different yeah. fronts. It can also go for the families, uh, the principal's siblings or yeah, I was just second say, cousin like, so-and-so their extended family, their extended network, they may not be in that trusted circle of relationships. So there's, um, there's so much that you see here and, and smell and taste and touch when you're working in this inner circle, but um, you have to know how to filter and you have to know what is um, the information that you're meant to relay to the outside party. And I think to Alan's point over time, you know, they'll know that you are a good steward of the information that you've been given and that you only say so much as to get something done um, and not go the extra mile and to say is why it needs to be done or giving those pertinent details that are not necessary. And then um, they'll trust you with the information and know that you can, you know, always be standing your ground and, and not giving out too much. So, um, you know, this the family- one, one, because you have to decide, and, and this is a really, really tough thing to say. You have to decide whether or not you're in the business because you think it's really cool and people will think you're really cool at a party, or you have to decide that you're in this business because you respect the fact that you're taking care of the needs of somebody and you're honoring the, the, the code of the service profession. Uh, a lot of people do this because they love the attention. I'm telling you, if you're at a party with an astronaut and a goat herder and a stripper, uh, and a political figure, and somebody says there's a butler over in the corner, boom, they all want to come and talk to you. And yeah. I grew up in the South, and in church, I can remember going back home to visit parents, and we'd be in church, and people would come over and in casual conversation. They'd say, they always, now these people that you work for, dot, dot, dot. And it's like, well, um, you know, you have to figure out a way to slide out of that. Uh, the current employer has a cousin who is about her age, and uh, she'll call sometimes, and she's been known as the, the brusque one in the family, and she won't even say hello, or and she's a real sweetheart. I mean, we get along just fine, and she'll call up, and she'll say, um, where is she? And I'll say, you know I have no idea. I, I, she doesn't tell me where she goes, and, and uh, she'll say, well, can you have her call me? Well, I can certainly do that. Would you like to leave a number? And now I'm just gigging her because she knows that she has the number. But um, 
you know, or it just, you have to sort of read the situation and, and, and do the best you can with it. But having a, a variety of answers like that, and sometimes um, I just ignore the question. If, if it's a vendor who wants to know, well, you know, I see that the bags are packed, are they leaving for so-and-so? It's like, well, my, my next question is, when do you think we'll be able to have the work finished? Yeah. You know, I'm not here to be your best friend. I don't need your validation. Uh, I'm not trying to be rude. It's just we have a job to do here, and let's go ahead and do that. The one thing that I've noticed from all of my employers, and they were big, hot shot corporate giants, is that the reason they were one of the main reasons they were so successful is that they were able to deal with problems bypassing the filter of emotion. If it's right, we do it. If it's wrong, we don't do it. Mm -hmm. And and they found ways to 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 work through that and get that done like that. So um, I was recently at a cocktail party, and one of my long-standing good friends of like 15 years was introducing me to someone new, and of course, and she's a trained butler, and came up and mm -hmm. da 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 da, and 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 the first question was, oh, who do you work for? And my friend stepped in before I could say anything and said, oh, good luck with that one. She doesn't answer that question. I don't even know who she works for, and we've been friends for 15 years. That's so, great. So I didn't even have to say boo. I just stood there and smiled. It was the funny thing is, is that if you serve someone in the public eye, um, you are part of the entourage and potentially you will be no, it will be known eventually who you work for. Um, but even if you don't work for someone in the public eye, if your principles have not set up the boundaries for safety and security that are recommended, um, like putting a, um, a fictitious business name on all of their accounts or their LLC that does not reflect the family's last name, um, you know, you can have the Olive Tree Corporation it doesn't have to say the Smith residence, you know, and, and all of the paychecks and things go through the LLC that they've set up. These are, these are um, measures that you can take to, to protect the family's last name so that not every vendor who walks the house realizes who they're serving. Um, and if the family's gone nine to five and you have all those vendors in, the fish tank guy, the pool guy, you know, these are people that never need to interface with, with Mr. and Mrs. most likely. Um, and so it's not necessary that they know that they're at this prestigious, um, you know, home or residence. I mean, clearly they know by the address and the, the, just the zip code that they're in a nice residence, but it just mitigates a lot of the, um, the gossip from vendors because they go from pool to pool to pool in the neighborhood and they will pick up and overhear things and they probably know more information than you and I will ever know. You know, it's, it's a very isolating industry working in private service when you're just taking care of this one property and you may not meet the other mansion, you know, house manager next door. So it is really great that we have this forum in DEMA to kind of, you know, talk about these things and raise the tides for everyone and, um, you know, speak about topics that are not necessarily, um, you know, out there in the public eye. But um, I do think that even if you, even if you have the utmost discretion, um, either the vendors will say who you work for if, if there's not that protection measure in place, or you'll just be known because you're interfacing with people on behalf of Mr. and Mrs. If you call for tickets to the opera and they're box ticket holders, you know, you have to say, well, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so want their box for Saturday night. Um, you know, it's, they're going to have to know who's showing up with the tickets for that particular place, you know, or, or if it's um, a personal appointment, a skincare appointment, a hair appointment. Um, there's only so much um, safeguarding you can do around their personal name and their um, persona before ultimately that individual does walk through the door and they're going to put two and two together that if you called that receptionist for that appointment that you ultimately work for that individual. Um, so I, I do think that, um, you know, just uh, again, to, to Alan's point, you know, not sharing the anecdotes, not sharing the stories. Um, will go a long way that you're maintaining and withholding that discretion, um, whether or not it does come out who you serve. This gets me to part B of that conversation. And that is that um, sometimes, and I've had employers do this, uh, because they know of, on the flip side of the coin here, because they know that I have a good rapport with the pool guy and I have a good rapport with the other people, they want to know sometimes what's going on in the neighborhood. <laughs> And so I don't, I just don't know. Gosh, I never hear of anything. It's like, I'm too busy pressing your sheets. 
you know, well, I have a staff for that. I want to be clear, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm too busy doing other things. I, I really don't know. I mean, I can listen around, but, and then never get back to them. But, and, and so that kind of squashes that right there, because if you give them the impression that you're telling what other people are doing, just because you want to be on the inside, um, they may start to wonder, gosh, I wonder if they're doing the same thing about me. Absolutely. Um, so let's move on. Maintaining confidentiality. Mm -hmm. Let's start over. Maintaining, <laughs> confidentiality, maintaining confidentiality and professional appearances, regardless of where you are or who you're with. So I'm going to start this off with an interesting story I heard way back 25 years ago in Butler School of a young butler who um, was new to private service and he would drop off his principal at the airport in the principal's Rolls Royce. And since he was off duty then, he would stop off at the gay bar for knock back a few before he went back to the house. And um, sooner, pretty soon, uh, after several weeks, um, the principal started getting razzed by his friends and neighbors about uh, frequenting the gay bar. Uh, and since the principal had no idea what was going on or uh, eventually put two and two together and the gentleman lost his job. Um, and um, so it really does matter what you do on your off time. Uh, represent, you are always representing the family, regardless of what you do, where you are, who you're with, and how you're presenting yourself. Um, as, so, so thoughts and ideas on that. Um, so I know later in the conversation, we're, we're going to be talking about living in and living out. And um, I have never lived in. That's the only scenario in which I have not experienced in private service. But um, I have lived in so much as go like Alan's point going to um, their vacation property and having to be with them in a remote area for extended periods or maybe you're in the bunkhouse or the pool house you know at the vacation home um, and in those smaller towns even when you have off time everyone knows you're there on behalf of the family so it, it does become like you are part of the entourage and they're watching when you go to the grocery store when you go to the ice cream parlor and when you go to all these quaint little places um in the town in which you know the the property is located um you are being watched and so that is tricky um but i do think that like anyone in you know a political career um realizes that they don't have a personal life anymore, that every time they go out of, in public that they're being watched. Um, I do think we kind of sign up for that. And, you know, I, I don't think that you have to be a robot and I don't think you have to be expected to be on all the time, but maintaining those boundaries, not talking to the checker as they're cashing you out, um, being polite, you know, but professional and, and, and not, you know, engaging in chit chat on behalf of the family, I think will go a long way and people will realize that you do have a personal life and you're entitled to a personal life, but um, you know, it's always under the microscope of the family that you serve. So um, it can be challenging and, and certainly, you know, we'll get to the live in, live out situation. But in my experience, um, that's been a little bit more um, uh, a finer point on it when I've uh, been in these smaller vacation towns where there's just one main street, you know, and you have to go to the same dry cleaners and grocery store and ice cream parlor on Saturday that you do for the family Monday through Friday. And, um, you know, there, there, it, it, there's not enough separation there, but we just, you know, do what we can during our off time to maintain that um, professional standard. Right. And so for me, it's always been uh, dressing appropriately and uh, for the, for my, where I'm going and always treating everyone kindly, regardless of where my mind is at. Um, and Alan, uh, you mentioned something about uh, favors or um, professional connections, taking advantage of things. Uh, be careful how you use favors offered from <clears throat> connections. Oh, yes. Um, I've had um, the, the, the gentleman who was building this compound uh, 11, 12 years ago, 
Um, really, really nice guy, very successful, uh, had businesses in Boston and had businesses here and, uh, and he loved this whole uh, development thing. And so he was kind of semi-retired at that point. His daughter was running his businesses and this was really something he was playing with. And so we got to know one another and, and, um, and I said, well, I've got to run down to the, whatever the service station, cause the, the guy there is going to put, uh, I need to see about some, some new tires. And he said, oh, he said, well, yeah, I know him. He does work for me and all the time. He said, tell him to put him on my bill. And um, I said, wow, that's, that's very, very gracious, but uh, I, I can't do that. And he said, well, what's the big deal? So, you know, it was just generous to a fault. And, um, and so, um, so at any rate, um, my feeling was that um, it's best not to get that sort of entangled and that palsy because I'm not there to become best friends with Mr. Generous. And so my response to him was, well, uh, and of course the, the younger folks won't remember this reference, but I said, well, I would, but we Waltons don't take charity. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he said, well, that's okay. But you know, and, and, he, and he was fine with that. Uh, but the other thing I want to mention um, before we get too far away was um, I had an employer uh, in Atlanta and really, really good guy and obviously very successful. And um, they would, had just finished a construction and I seems like I get invited in to finish more constructions, I, I, projects, I don't know why. But the builder was not, you know how they get at the end of these things, how they just have moved on to something else and now it's a real pain for them to come back and take care of the punch out, punch out list and all that. And so I was on the phone with the guy's secretary and I thought I was, do I was young and stupid and uh, I'm zealous and I wanted to do the right thing by my employer. And so I'm on the phone saying, well, you know, I don't understand. We've already paid for this. And, and I was really being sort of, well, snotty. And so the boss said, I'm going to go run an errand. He said, would you mind to go with me and help me? And I said, of course, it was toward the end of the day. So we're in the car and he said, well, he said, I want to talk to you for a minute. We I had a conversation with whatever her name was. And she was telling me that you were a little angst ridden over some things that were not going on. I said, well, I'm just looking out for your interests. And he said, uh, did you ever see the movie Roadhouse? And I said, uh, it's been a long time. He said, just been out not too many years. He said, there was a line in there that um, the guy says to all of his other bar bouncers, he says, be nice. Just remember to be nice. I'm shortening the conversation, but, but um, he said, you know, when you, even though you're right, even though you are standing your ground and you're right, you've got to find a way to round the corners on your words. But wow, I like that. I like that phrase and I'm going to keep it and I'm going to steal it. You've got to find a way to round the corners on your words because if you put your hand up and you put up a wall, uh, the chances of you getting anything done in the future, you know, and plus the bottom line is, is when you do that, you're representing me. Wow, you know, so I got an education from the boss who was very gracious enough not to say get out, you know, so it was a, kind of a neat situation. I've learned a lot from employers that way. Absolutely. Um, anyway, moving on. All right. Um, so next up, how to have a personal life when you live on site? Now, I actually spent my first 10 years in private service on site, and I've uh, lived in, I've lived on site, and I've also lived off property. Um, and I'll just run through the list, and then we can just kind of banter some things back and forth. But the list we came up with was, first off, the boundaries need to be established at the interview process uh, and within the interview process and should be in writing. Uh, can you have guests on the property and when? Uh, when are your days off and what can you use on the property? Where can you go on the property on your days off? Who can come to your quarters during your time off, if ever? Um, the more you establish on the front end, the smoother things will go. Um, create and agree to the rules in the beginning and then don't break the rules for any reason. Um, comments from the peanut gallery, Alan? From me? Yes, I bet you have countless guests in your quarters. What I always did was I said, um, I don't want to, because my, my, uh, my, my initial 
thinking in all of that is I don't use any property amenities. I don't use the pool. I don't drive the cars unless it's go put gas in them. And um, so, um, but I would say to them, would it be okay if we put a list together that rather than saying we need a list, that would it be okay if we put a list together to make sure that everybody's on the same page and me to say in this list what I think that your expectations are and then you and then you make this list and get it to you and, and get it to them pretty quickly um, email it to them or, or whatever you need to do just to make sure that everybody's on the same page and if you want to put down something like if you're fishing if you want to put down for, for, for a response you want to put down something like um, you know no guests at any time and they'll come back and they'll say oh well we don't mind if you have guests um, or uh, no parties at any time oh well we don't mind if you entertain uh, but you might want to do it in more way that kind of thing uh, so you establish the, the most strict and, and then they'll let you know if you can lighten up or they'll look at it and say and then if, um, and then if you have any questions about that, or if you're talking about that and they haven't addressed any of these things, you know, oh, wow, I've really boxed myself in. You can say, well, I didn't know if, if, if it was okay to have just a few people over or, and kind of plant that seed in their head. And they'll say, oh, well, come to think of it. Yeah, well, I mean, if you're gonna have a few guests over, you know, you might wanna do it after dark or, or uh, on the weekends or, and, and they'll clear it up for you. But I've always uh, said, would it be okay if I put a list together saying what I think your expectations might be and what the norms are in the industry, and then you can give me feedback on that. And they say, oh, well, that's fine. That's fine. I like that. I like that. Yeah. You're not the boss of me. No, actually, I guess they are. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer? Um, sure. Our principal's on the phone. Give me one moment. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll head over to Alan. Alan I've, I've got it. I just let him know I'm on a conference call. Um, okay. So, yes, uh, I, this was my initial kind of point when we last talked um, about getting everything in writing up front. Um, I have worked with some um, incredible candidates and things during the hiring process for principals and um, you know, having them articulate their preferences prior to um, the final negotiation, I think is critical. Um, and there's all different types of scenarios. There are single um, female butlers and single male house managers and all these things that the situation, you know, may be very different um, from if they're gonna be a five or 10 year run with a particular family, maybe their family dynamics are going to change, you know? Um, so they may not yet know if they are single or partnered or with children, and it's a live-in environment, um, you know, what that entails. Oppositely, um, you know, you may well disclose right in the get-go that you have a family, and if they're requiring you to be live-in, are my children allowed to play on the lawn? You know, are they allowed to have friends over? You know, what can be done in, in the private residence? I do think that it's a little bit easier if the physical building is separate from the main residence, if it's a pool house or something a, a little bit off where you have your own driveway, um, that's much easier to maintain um, some, some separation from your work life and your personal life. Um, and they're giving you that live-in quarters as a benefit to you and a, and a benefit to them, let's be honest. They want you at a, a back and call at a moment's notice. But, um, you know, I did have um, a, a, a strange live-in situation um, while I was training for private service. I was in property management. Um, and in commercial property management, I was given a free um, living quarters um, to, to, you know, to actually be on site and, and, you know, to see if things would go wrong. So while it wasn't directly related to a principal, um, you know, we respected the fact that we were in um, corporate housing and that it was a benefit to the position. And we were there if, if situations arose and it was few and far between, but occasionally we would have to get up and, you know, the sprinklers would go off or there was a fire alarm or something like that. Um, and you know, it, there's, there's good and bad with it. You have to decide if the position is one that you really want to, to accept that um, it's going to be a good working relationship and it's also going to be a good live in or live out um, situation. But I do think that getting all of that information up front and clearing the waters will go a long way to um, preventing any problems uh, down the road. Absolutely. Over Absolutely. time, as you work your way into this culture, and it really is a culture unto itself, mm -hmm. Um, 
you begin to develop a feel for what's good and what's not good and how to read people, um, it's kind of like the perfect pie crust. Uh, there's no recipe that will allow you to do it right every, every time. You just have to sort of develop a feel for it. Um, one of the things I would strongly suggest in terms of personal development is when I started doing this sort of thing, I, I did it because I just needed a job. I never realized I would love it or, 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 or do this well at it. Um, and it has provided a really, really nice uh, living for me. Um, and I'm doing what I love to do and I'm happy to do. But when I started, um, I just wanted to be employed and live indoors. <laughs> and so I miraculously got hooked up with a principal my first time out who was a, an amazing mentor and we were very, very close. I was with him for five years, but we were very, very close until the day he passed away about six years ago. And I'm still like, very close with his wife, who is now almost 80. Uh, so when I travel to Atlanta, I stop in and I stay with her for a couple of days. We're like family. Uh, but the thing is, back then, we didn't have things like DEMA. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have things like cell phones. We were not connected at all. We just kind of had to feel our way around. Uh, and so now, we have people that we can interact with who've been in the business for a long time. Uh, my advice is to get a mentor. If you learned how to speak English from listening to your parents when you were between the ages of one and five, and then you sort of improved on those skills when you learned how to advance that skill from teachers when you got into kindergarten and first and second grade, and then you begin to advance that skill when you got into junior school and then on up into high school and college and listening to other radio programs and talk radio and whatever else, uh, and you learn how to hone your communication skills, uh, you could use the same principle to, um, to and apply that to your life with, with mentoring yourself in your career. Get around people who have done it and can advise you and have conversations with you about it. And also, the other thing I want to mention is to set aside three to four hours a week at least uh, to do self-study. Whether it's classes online or um, whether it's uh, going to the library or the bookstore. Uh, my professional library is at least close to 600 volumes. Everything from... Uh, economics to to cooking to HVAC to cigar to wine to cheese um, uh, smart home technology it, it's it's all there I've got a huge reference and that's just my personal uh, my professional library not my personal library uh, always be doing something to make yourself the most valuable person in the marketplace for what you do live eat breathe and sleep this and then when you have your off times you can really relax amen preach it brother as you can tell, I'm not very passionate about it. <laughs> so who was the first person I called <clears throat> when I was downsized last year? Alan. Uh, well. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway, um, we, so let's broach one more quick topic before we log off for today. But um, online, um, some agencies, there's pros and cons with having an online presence. Some agencies only post jobs on Facebook or LinkedIn, and some employers won't hire you simply because you have an online presence or account. Um, thoughts, comments, suggestions? I'll, I'll field this one first. Um, so I do uh, think that you're entitled to a personal online presence. Um, I don't think that employers can, um, you know, uh, dictate that in any way, but uh, I think it's important in, again, if you can establish these boundaries and guidelines in the interviewing process um, or, you know, right at the get-go at a new, um, a new position, I do think that it will go a long way to kind of, you know, navigating the ship down the road. Um, and initially, I think that it's a fear-based uh, model where they just forbid any online presence because they don't want anything leaking. Um, but I think that if you are forthright and you can kind of step up and say, look, I maintain a Facebook account or I have a personal Twitter to keep up with family and friends, um, I will never post anything regarding this position on social media. I will not list who my employer is on social media, um, you know, but I... I I keep up with family and friends and, you know, pictures or whatnot, um, because I enjoy that on my off time. Um, I think that there's an arc that um, we've come to the other side of it now. Maybe 10 years ago, people were, I think, forbidding, um, you know, <clears throat> employers even in a commercial uh, environment to do this. But now I think that people understand the separation. 
Um, I maintain a professional Facebook and a personal Facebook. Um, and I am not even friends with any of my colleagues, any of you on my, per my personal one, because I just don't think that what I ate for dinner and you know, taking a picture of what I cooked that night is necessarily relevant to my career. But um, for terms of networking and marketing on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter, um, there's a way that you could do this professionally and, um, you know, and still maintain that, that boundaries. I think if you were to defend this position with an employer who was hesitant in this regard, you could go one step further and educate yourselves and, and, and have some key points in saying, these are the things that I've done to safeguard my online presence um, and reassure you that I will not be using it in such a manner. Um, I don't know how many people know about geotags in your actual phone. Um, you can turn that on or off and actually in the metadata of a picture, it will, um, log all of this information like your your gps location and the time and date you took it and all these types of things mm -hmm. and all of us that might have to take a picture to send to a vendor on a leak or hvac problem um if you email that and they get into the metadata they absolutely know where that is coming from um so certainly you're not going to be posting that on social media that is like a big no-no but um, where this gets tricky is, let's say you're taking a picture of a Picasso for the art curator or something of that nature. Um, the location of where that painting is located, whether it's a storage unit or a, a, a summer home or, you know, the, the main residence itself, it's all located in the data. And so if you can say, Mr. Principal, I'm aware of these, you know, security risks and I have turned that off on my cell phone so that, you know, I've safeguarded it so much more than, you know, what you're even asking me. They realize that you've educated yourself in this and that um, you're, you're taking an online cybersecurity um, presence very strongly and that you won't be crossing those boundaries. And I think that that's the best that anyone can ask. You know, certainly to your point, Natalie, um, you know, some agencies are requesting an online presence. Um, certainly, I think LinkedIn is appropriate. I would still be hesitant to give out my face, my personal Facebook to, um, you know, to an agency or something like that. And I have my personal Facebook settings completely locked down. And I have my friends who are not my friends online check it regularly. And I say, if you Google me, can you only see my headshot and a blank screen? Or is there something leaking through that I've liked? Groups that I might support, you know, all of these things um, can, can give some negative light to you if you're aligning yourself with a, pr a principle that doesn't believe in what you believe in online, you know? So um, it, it's challenging, but I think it can be done. And as long as you go in with um, conviction and just say, I've, I've taken these safeguards, I think that they can't fault you for that. Right. So I, I too have yeah. geotagging turn off. I have Facebook is only for my personal friends and only uh, posts for personal friends. And then I also um, don't allow anyone to tag me in photos. Um, and then LinkedIn is for, for my professional contacts. Um, I but I still was turned down for, I, I was still turned down for a, a, uh, a job interview because I had mm -hmm. online accounts. Wow. So it's unfortunate. Yeah. Yes, it was. I'm sorry, Ellen, I cut you off. What was that? I was just going to say, I have a Facebook account. I never look at it because I'm an adult, but um, I know that's going to upset a lot of people, but um, <laughs> Yeah, and I would have told those people, um, I would have said, well, that's okay. Just go ahead and settle for second best. I don't care. No, I'm just, I'm <laughs> All right, so we did have a, we have a question. Um, we have a question for Alan. In regard to the personal study, professional growth time, do you use, do you do, you do this during work hours or your personal time? Uh, well, if, if it's specific to what I'm trying to do on, on the estate right now, of course I use personal time, but I use a lot of off time as well. Uh, I try to spend at least a few hours a month just wandering through different stores and doing nothing but looking and observing because I live and work, um, you know, under the, the watchful eye of my employer all the time. So I have to get away. Sometimes I'll just drive down to Miami and just kind of wander around to just kind of if, A, recharge my batteries, but B, see what's going on out there and see what's new and available uh, either for entertaining events or uh, new products or, or things that can help me do what I do better. Uh, but then, uh, so I do it both in the off time and, and um, at work. Right. So if it's, let me just reiterate, because I think uh, uh, there was a typo in what you said. Um, for if you're learning something for work, you will take work time to educate oh, yourself. Right. 
And I let the boss know that I'm going to do that. They, they, they know, but they know that I manage my time well and, and, um, you know, and I'm, I'm on a lot of balls. So to speak. Absolutely. So. You know, if they'd like you to research something, it's going to take time to do that research and there's a learning curve on everything. Right. Perfect. Um, any other questions? I'm not seeing any right now. So we'll go ahead and wrap things up for today. Um, no math questions, please. No math questions. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Alan, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.